Hello and welcome to another edition of the College of DuPage Police Department podcast. My name is Lieutenant Monsterman. In 2022, the Federal Trade Commission reported receiving 5.7 million fraud reports from consumers, including a total loss of $5.9 billion. Whether through robocalls, smishing, phishing, skimming, breaching, and social engineering, fraudsters are constantly evolving their tactics and honing their skills to defraud consumers. Our guest today, and we couldn't be more honored to have him, is Mike Carroll, the International President of the International Association of Financial Crimes Investigators. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Ted, for having me on the show. Thank yeah. you. Mike Carroll spent 29 years as a postal inspector with the United States Postal Inspection Service and spent most of his career working external crimes uh, like mail theft cases. Uh, and he also spent four years in an undercover assignment handling a myriad of financial crimes investigations, including mail theft, mail fraud, credit card and debit card fraud, uh, and identity theft. <clears throat> in fact, Mike was such an awesome employee that the uh, Postal Inspection Service decided to hire him back in an analytical role. That's correct. As an analyst. Uh, Mike was nominated most recently as the president, the international president, I should add, of the International Association of Financial Crimes Investigators uh, in 2019, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So a huge honor there, I'm sure. That's a big deal. Uh, Mike also serves as an adjunct instructor with the College of DuPage, uh, Suburban Law Enforcement Academy, where he teaches classes on fraud, fraud awareness, fraud prevention, and also financial crimes investigations. Uh, Mike, to get us started, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your role with the IAFCI and also uh, the Protectors podcast that you guys run. Sure, Ken, and thank you for having me today. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. You it's know, the International right. Association of Financial Crime Investigators has been around for about 53 years. Um, it's an organization made up of state, federal, local law enforcement, along with credit card investigators and bank investigators. Uh, not only do we have members here in the states, but we have international members. We have over 800 international members from Australia, South Africa, Germany, and Hong Kong. So it's a great organization. And there are some goals, what are the purposes of, of the IFCI? One of them is to share information among members. Um, we provide the best training and education, not only to our members, but to the public and all the frauds and scams that are going on out there. So I started out as a chapter president here in Illinois. I moved to international treasurer, uh, international secretary, international vice president, and now I'm the international president and I'm on my last year as international president, and uh, next year I'll move up to the chairman of the IFCI. Well, the IFCI has been kind of near and dear to my heart. I'm kind of a financial crimes nerd myself, um, and it's been a huge resource to us through some of our investigations and the, the regional um, conferences and things like that. So we appreciate everything that you've done in the fraud community and for the IFCI over, over the years for sure. How did you find your passion or your niche in financial crimes? It's kind of a a specialized niche. It intimidates a lot of law enforcement people. How did you find your niche? How did you find your love for it? Well, actually, I got to go back just to how I got into law enforcement. When I was a kid going to grammar school, I used to go to our library and read books about Ma Barker and John <laughs> Dillinger yeah. and uh, how the FBI and the Secret Service caught them. So I always had an interest in law enforcement. And then I went to Moraine Valley Junior College and I started taking cra uh, classes, excuse me, on criminal justice, mm -hmm. and I found them very interesting. So that was my major. I was going to pursue in criminal justice, and from there I went to Western Illinois University. Me too. You did? I did. I didn't know that. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe a go, little after you. Go leather next. Just <laughs> a little right, after yeah. me. Yeah. And uh, I got a degree in law enforcement, and uh, getting out of college, uh, I applied for different police departments, and uh, I got a job at the post office working as a letter carrier, and somebody came up to me and said, hey, you ever heard of postal inspectors? I go, no, what are they doing? We're federal law enforcement. Yeah. So I applied for them and I got hired. And I started out in an undercover assignment and then I got involved in financial crimes where I'm at today, now as an analyst. But most of my career as a postal inspector, I work financial crimes. And then now back with the inspection services and analysts, I help our mail theft and financial crimes teams uh, putting cases together, reviewing documents. But Financial crimes is not easy. It's you got to have a niche for that because you got to follow the money, and then now there's layers of money where somebody could be a victim of identity theft, and they get a credit card in somebody's name, 
and then they'll go out and buy gift cards and put the money on there, or then they'll, they'll Venmo or Zelle it to another account. So right. it's not that easy. You know, it's a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, it's not as easy as, say, somebody selling drugs and boom, you make the arrest, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, I love it. I love what I do right now, too. And then the introduction of cryptocurrency adds a whole other layer of complexity to it. And yes. Can I give my uh, going, my standing joke that I've been using? Please. When every time I go to a presentation for <laughs> cryptocurrency or bitcoins, I always say, boy, I still got an 8-track player, you know, <laughs> yeah. just trying to learn about it, you know, trying to get a grasp on it. But that's yeah. where it's going to cryptocurrency and bitcoins. And we've had some cases involving elderly that got caught up in a scam where the fraudster instructed them to go to an ATM Bitcoin machine and insert the cash. And then that money would go onto a Bitcoin wallet yeah. of somebody that's a fraudster that's involved in this. It's overseas. <clears throat> right. So yeah, I'm always learning. It's always about staying on top of all these different types of frauds and scams. Your eight track is probably equivalent to like today's checkbook. There you go. <laughs> Who uses, I guess I still use a checkbook. I'm probably one of the few. But. Yeah, the younger generation, very few use a, use a checkbook, but we still have the elderly using their, you know, yeah. using the mail to pay their bills and things like that. So we still have to stay on top of it. <laughs> I do too. So I guess that makes me elderly. I don't know. <laughs> one of the things I think that's overlooked, one of the things that kind of made me realize the importance of like fraud prevention and fraud awareness is my grandpa was victimized uh, several years ago. He was 96 years old. I just told you the story, but I'll tell the people listening to our little presentation here the story. He was about 96 years old and Jamaican lotto scammers started targeting him and uh, basically talked him into sending $30,000 to three different people throughout the country. And I saw the emotional toll that that took on my grandpa. He was devastated. This is a World War II veteran a guy that grew up with nothing in Mississippi, a guy who made it through the Great Depression, experienced so much in his life, and at the very last days of his life, these fraudsters got the best of him, and it took an emotional toll on him. He was convinced that people were outside his you know, house rattling cans and were knocking on his door looking for money and stuff like that. I think that's one of the things that's overlooked with financial crimes sometimes, is like the emotional toll that financial crimes can take on people. And I found some interesting statistics uh, recently um, that speak to the emotional toll that it takes on people. According to the Identity Theft Resource Center, 84% of victims report feeling anxious, which I guess doesn't say much because a lot of people are anxious nowadays, but 76% felt violated after they were victimized and 10% expressed having suicidal ideations or suicidal thoughts. That's, that's pretty, dr pretty dramatic, pretty, uh, pretty serious stuff. Right. What, in your experience, have you learned anything through your 30 plus years of financial crimes experience that you can share in terms of the emotional impact that, that you've experienced. Sure, one more, one more stat I would think to go along with that, a lot of them are embarrassed to, oh, re yeah. to report it. Yep. They don't want to report it because they yeah. feel embarrassed, ashamed. Um, not only the victim, and when we talk about elder fraud, it, it's, it's so terrible, you know, not only the elder victim, but family members. We had one case where an elderly lady met somebody online uh, fell in love and, and was sending money. And the daughter went over there and told her mom, this is a scam, don't get involved mom, don't yeah. do it. You know, she would leave the house, you know, an hour later mom's sending money to this fraudster, alleged boyfriend yeah. or soon to be married, somebody that they're gonna soon to get married with. And uh, even when law enforcement went to the house and told them that you're committing a crime and then law enforcement leaves, they're still sending money. Crazy. So, yep. you know, we, contact our, our parents and grandparents maybe once a day or, or once a week, but these fraudsters are calling these victims nine times a day. Yep. They're their best friend. Yep. They're, they, you know, some of these uh, victims of elder fr fraud are lonely and they don't have any, uh, nobody calling them. And when these fraudsters call them and tell them how beautiful they are and they're gonna live happily ever after. Yep. You know, one of the things that always happens on these scams is whatever the elder person might say, the fraudster follows with that are you divorced? No, my husband passed away. Well, my dad just passed away. Yeah. Um, and, and they kind of relate to that. You know, do you have any children? Yes, I have four. Why? Well, I have four children too. And they, they become friends. And then there's that favor. You know, I need, I need you to send me money or we'll live happily ever after. And it's heartbreaking to see. And just one more thing to go along with what you're saying. Um, some of these scams involving the lottery, it's operated outside the country. Right. But with social media, they will say, you know, once when, they've taken all the victims, elder victims money, and they're trying to get more, and they're like, I have no more money to give. Well, you know what? We're down the street. 
we see your house with the red yeah, awning yeah. because they see that on uh, MapQuest or sure. whatever, and they know what the house looks like. Now, yeah. if you don't send me any money, we're going to come over here and terrorize you and your family. So that's heartbreaking breaking to see that. Well, one of the things you said is the first thing they say is how embarrassed they are. And I remember distinctly a phone call I had with my grandpa. The first thing he said, he was in tears with his grandson talking about how embarrassed he was, you know? Just, it's, just, it's just heartbreaking to see a loved one, especially somebody that's gone through that much in their life, go through right. something like that. Um, so yeah, the emotional toll is a real thing. Um, so Mike, financial crimes are incredibly lucrative. They take a terrible emotional toll on people. Fraud awareness and fraud uh, prevention strategies are tremendously important. You guys do an awesome job on that on your podcast. People should definitely check that out, the Protectors Podcast. Um, Available on Apple and Spotify? Yes, it is. Awesome. Yes, it is. Good stuff. What are some common schemes that are targeting college kids in particular? Uh, actually, we came up with the IFCI. We came up with a top 10 scams targeting college students, and we made a, put together a guide. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're up to 15. 15. Now, top 15 right. uh, scams that are targeting uh, college kids. I'm just going to name a few. I think one of the top ones, we talked about work-at-home scams. Uh, another one is a lot of young kids getting recruited on uh, social media. Hey, you need to make some money. Um, I need either to get your debit card and PIN number, and I'm going to put a check into your account, yep. or I'll send you a check. Please deposit this check into your account. I, I got some grant money, and I have nobody to cash this check for money. I'll have them make it payable to you. You deposit it and just Venmo me or Zell me 10, yeah. you know, 80%, and you could keep 20%. So I see a lot of that. Uh, another one, unfortunately, is a sextortion. Uh, scam out yep. there where you meet somebody online and you exchange compromising photos and then the person comes back and is an extorter and say hey uh, you know you've been communicating with my daughter who's underage uh, you need to send me money or else I'm gonna post all these pictures on social media so that's another one that young kids need to be be aware of so that's a big one and uh, just be just remember if you send money via Z a Zelle or Venmo and it's related to a scam, it's almost impossible to get the money back. So make sure you know who you're communicating with when you send that money. Make sure it's somebody that's legit. And, and like, just like school, do your homework. Yeah. You know, like you, we talked earlier about these work at home scams. You know, I mean, take, take the, even the scholarship, you know, hey, we, I could get you a better scholarship at 1% at interest, you know, loan. And, um, you know, do your homework. Check that company out before you you know, have to pay an upfront fee because most of these work at homes or, or uh, these uh, loan companies, they always want seem they want money up in, up in advance and then mm -hmm. they just keep the money and that's it. You're, you're out the funds. What would you say the most common indicators are of fraud? If somebody's looking for indicators that a deal, an opportunity might be fraudulent, what are the top indicators they should be looking for? You know, we're lying with the Postal Inspection Services. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably Absolutely. is. Yep. That's what it is. If it sounds too good, it, it, there's something. You, like you said, you need just to do your homework, um, the urgency. They want you to reply urgency. immediately. Yep. So a couple of reasons, you, they don't want you to think, and they don't want you to talk to anybody else. You know, And that's another thing you, you're talking about as, as you see something that might be too good to be true, talk to your friends. Ask them, hey, have you ever heard of this before? You know, I'm going to get this loan for, you know, 0 0.9 interest. You know, ah, that's probably a scam. You better check it out, you know. So I think urgency is one of them, um, sounding too good to be true, and, and basically do your homework. Uh, we see a lot of, like, emails with bad grammar and, and, and unprofessional presentation of, like, a, a corporate, corporate email, you know. Kent, i got to jump in there because that is, you're absolutely right. Yeah. If you... <laughs> We would joke about it, if you get an email from a fraudster, if you got three or more misspelled words, yeah. it's probably fraud. Because exactly. they're not even using spell check. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that's another good one. Uh, I'll tell you, every one of those scams that you just mentioned, I think we've had students at the college come to us who have been victimized from it. What should, aside from reporting it to local law enforcement, what other steps should, should students take after they've been victimized? Any well, other recommendations? No, well, I think number one is probably make a police report. Mm -hmm. go, yep. go to your you know local police department, make a report. Most of them will take that report, even though the fraud might occur outside the country, but they'll they'll you know take a report for you. Uh, if it involves a financial institution, notify them right away. Get to your bank, let them know that hey, uh, 
you know, I, I, I check I deposited was no good. I want to put a stop payment or, 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 or try to get my funds back, you know, the money back that I sent out. Um, another thing that students can do, um, you know, if you're, you think you're a victim related to a scam and, it, it, and, and you might be a victim of identity theft, you could always notify the three major credit bureaus. You could go to annualcreditreport.com and you can notify each of the three credit bureaus that you're a victim of identity theft and they'll put an alert on your credit bureau. That means if somebody tries to apply for credit in your name, they'll notify you. So you'll, have an, you'll know that somebody might be trying to get right. credit in your name and it'll prevent them from getting it. That's sage advice for sure. And so many of our students could use that advice given the number of fraud scams that are targeting them nowadays. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about and kind of related to what we talked about before with careers in, in financial crimes investigations, fraud investigations, what are some opportunities that our students could possibly look into as far as career fields in the fraud industry? Not really a commonly sought after path with college students, but I'm wondering if there are opportunities for them. There is. I mean, just as my position, I'm an analyst, I'm a contractor analyst. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that are looking for contractor analysts. Um, it's a great field. I like it because you're helping law enforcement putting cases together for prosecution. Mm -hmm. But on that end, there's retail stores that are always looking for investigators. When you think of retail stores, you think of like loss prevention, trying to catch somebody stealing. Or, no, there's more to that. There's um, putting cases together, um, checking out uh, the, uh, the fraud use of checks and credit cards, identifying organized retail crime gangs. So there's a great opportunity in, in a financial crime as a financial crime investigator, which could lead to, if you want to get into law enforcement, that's a great background to have For sure. as a financial crime investigator. But I like it because you, you're, you're putting a puzzle together as an investigator. For sure. um, <clears throat> the other thing I, I like of it is uh, starting with nothing and ending up with something. And as far as a financial crime investigator, it's good if you're a good report writer. If you could do that, that's always good to have as a For background. Sure. And yeah. some good, um, how can I say, expertise on social media and the internet and tracking people down. That's a good, you yeah. know, get involved in that too. Yeah. Um, it, for me, I, I agree with you. For all the reasons you just mentioned, starting out with nothing, starting out with one identity theft complaint and then turning it into a, you know, a giant ring of people. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. Seeing it to fruition and seeing it from A to disease tremendously rewarding. It does take a lot of patience and tenacity. Yes. You have to be tenacious. You have to be a pit bull and not let go of it. And it's easy to let go of it when you got other things going on. But um, anyway, I, I'm, I, I'm just like you. I, I love it very much. In closing, um, if people want to learn more about the IAFCI and the resources that you guys offer, where can they go to learn more? Well, we have a public website, IAFCI.gov. You can go on there and learn about our organization. We are, we are looking for students that are interested in financial crime investigations, investigations excuse me, or want to get into law enforcement. Mm -hmm. We are taking applications and membership as students. It's a lower fee involved, but if you go on our IFCI public website, you'll learn all about our organization and how to sign up. Um, I would ask to, to, our, to your students, and we talked about elder fraud, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and one of the things I want to ask our stu the students from College of the Page Keep an eye on grandma and grandpa. If you're over visiting and you see a stack of mail, you see uh, Western Union receipts, wire receipts, you see phone bills, a uh, lot of messages on the phone, um, maybe get a hold of mom and dad to let them know, hey, maybe something's going on. You know, maybe grandma's caught up or grandpa's caught up and like you mentioned before, yeah. with a lottery scam or yeah. something, you know? Um, we want you to keep an eye on them. And the other thing I, I want to bring up is it's kind of ironic because when we were growing up, right, we were told not to talk to strangers. Now we have to tell our parents and our grandparents the same That's thing. That's right, yeah. Don't talk to strangers. Yeah. Because they're, that phone, they're co constantly on the phone 10 times a day. They have all the time in the world, the fraudsters. Yeah. They, they're, they're, they're not doing anything. So they're on, on, on the uh, Internet, on social media, looking for people vulnerable that they could reach out to. Uh, one that we're seeing now, uh, Kent, that, uh, and again, this is for, for college students, is the grandchild in trouble. Right. That's a big one, right? Yeah. Uh, grandma gets a call from 
purporting their grandson or granddaughter, not knowing the name, because they'll say, Grandma, this is your favorite grandson or granddaughter. Oh, Johnny? Yes, it's Johnny. I'm in trouble. I'm in jail. I need you to go buy gift cards and wire me the, and take, read the numbers off the back of the gift cards, which go on to other gift cards, and uh, get them to me so I could get out of jail. Or leave the money in the mailbox. The police will come by and pick it up. Yeah. So one of the things we re recommend for college kids, uh, you know, maybe have a password with grandma and grandpa. Maybe come up with a word so they know it's you when you're calling. One of the things you mentioned, and I remembered what I wanted to talk about before, is like the social engineering component of it. One of the sayings that I heard is that uh, computer hackers hack computers, social engineers hack people. And that's exactly what they do. With, with all the examples that you shared and with my grandpa, uh, they identified a vulnerability and they, they took advantage of it. They took advantage of the fact that he was lonely and he, he liked talking to people on the phone, just like you said. And they took full advantage of it and victimized him in the process. So social engineers are experts at what they do. They, they, are, they dedicate their lives to it. Imagine if they dedicated their lives to creating meaningful relationships a, with actual people. Exactly. That's what <laughs> we always said, that, you know, they use their talent for the good. Yeah. You know, we, we need to, like with you and, and, and your, your police department, and, and we, we need to join together. We need to get our citizens and, and law enforcement and all our invest, bank investigators, we need to join together mm. to get the word out. My, my boss used to tell me, you can't rest yourself out of all these, these, these scams. For Prevention sure. is the Absolutely. key, and we need to get the word out. And Ken, I'd like to discuss with you after, <laughs> maybe there's something we could talk about as far as putting together something for college kids some bullet points on what to see or what to look for when they go visit grandma and grandpa. We could maybe come up with maybe a little pilot program Absolutely, here. We could try, yeah. try something, I love it. you know? Yeah. That'd be awesome. One of the things you were mentioning, the piles of muddy grams for my grandpa, it was the piles of sweepstakes. All the sweepstakes mailings that they send you, and it seems to me, and you could, you could probably tell me better, the more you fill out, the more you get. <laughs> the more you send in, the more you receive. And exactly. so they just pile up and pile up. Because what they call it is a sucker's list. Yeah. Once you, once you answer any lottery or fortune teller or anything related to a scam, you're put on a sucker's list and they share that information, they sell that information. Yeah. And you're right. You know what I always say about the lottery scam is that uh, the, the scam is you won a million dollars, but you know, Frank got fired, he forgot to tell you, you owe the taxes, you owe $5,000, <laughs> right? So I'm gonna send you a check, because I'm a nice guy, I'm gonna send oh. you a check for 5,000, you deposit that check and just wire me the money yeah and then your taxes are paid for. And then obviously the check comes back no good and they're out the money, but they keep on lulling them. Don't you want to yeah. take care of your kids? You need to send another 5,000 for taxes. My thing was, okay, if you win 100,000 in a lottery and you owe 5,000 for the taxes, can't they just take the five out of the 100,000 <laughs> exactly, winnings and yeah. just email me or wire me to 95,000, you know? But, you know, people, they get blinders. They don't think they get caught up in these, you know, they want to help their family members yeah. and things like that. Like you yeah. mentioned with, with, your, with your dad. And they're such good social engineers, they develop such trust with, th these people couldn't possibly be lying to me. You know, exactly. So it's exactly. crazy. Even when law enforcement come to the house, had in cases in the past where the fraudsters on the phone while we're there, tell them, no, don't listen to law enforcement, yeah. they're lying to you, I'm the yeah. one, I'm, I'm your favorite, you know, I'm your, gonna be your future husband or wife, don't listen to them, you know, it's just crazy. It is. Well, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to come on out. I know it's you're a busy man nowadays. No, I Even in your retired here. life, you're still a busy man. <laughs> They're keeping you running hard. So I couldn't, couldn't thank you more. Um, if you want to learn more about the classes and opportunities that the COD Police Department offers, you can visit us on Instagram, on Facebook. That's where you typically see these podcasts and also on YouTube. And we look forward to seeing you again on our next podcast episode.